Well, hello, everybody. This is Brent Sanjan at The Ohio State University. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate your, your interest in this subject and your interest in attending this webinar. Uh, this webinar is the second of the year in a series that we are having through the OSU Extension Climate Change Team. Uh, the previous webinar in uh, September was on climate change and human health in the Great Lakes region. And we also had two previous webinars last year on cap and trade and climate change and water resource impacts. All those are archived as we'll archive this webinar and available on our website, which you can see, changingclimate.osu.edu. We want to let you know that there are two upcoming webinars uh, on 11-2, that being, I believe, Election Day, uh, impacts, of, uh, impacts of climate change on Great Lakes forests and farms, and on 12-7, impacts on climate change on water quality in the Great Lakes. We hope you can join us for both of those, and we'll be sure to uh, send out advertising for those as we get closer to the dates. Just a little bit about the OSU Extension Climate Change Team. It's composed of numerous partners within OSU and outside. Uh, at OSU, uh, we're, we're working together with Ohio Sea Grant, uh, the OSU Extension Watershed Program, the OSU Climate, Water, and Carbon Targeted Initiative and in Excellence, uh, the Bird Polar Center, uh, several departments at OSU are, are participating fairly heavily in this. That's the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics, the School of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, the Department of Geology, and the Department of Geography. Members of all those departments have participated in our planning for this, and as well as uh, they've participated as individuals who are uh, giving webinars throughout the year. So we want to give a big thanks to all of them. Outside the university, we're also partnering with a number of other Great Lakes universities uh, through the Great Lakes Regional Water Program. Thanks to everybody for their support, in particular to OSU Extension for allowing us to use the WebEx meeting facility. So without further ado, I want to go into uh, the webinar itself. Um, a couple, Just a couple notes on that before I, I do, though. Of course, we've got to have a few notes. The one thing is, is that, um, or the one most important thing that you might wonder is, how are you going to ask questions during this webinar? Uh, the way we're going to do that, and the way we'd like to do that, is ask you to go ahead and use the chat facility. That should be located on the right hand of your screen. You should be able to see a way to get to the to the chat function. And basically, if you have a question throughout, just uh, put a question out to everyone. Uh, write it down and send it out, and I will keep track of those. I'll actually be copying them and uh, keeping them on a separate page. And as we get to the end of the webinar, uh, I will then go through those and try to categorize them uh, into uh, a set of categories and a set of questions that we can ask uh, Dr. Herms. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and pose those to Dr. Herms. Uh, it's very difficult, of course, with this many people in the webinar to, to try to interact over, over this method. So the best way for us would be if you just send a chat, and we'll keep track of that question and ask Dr. Herms at the end. Um, we do want to note that this is being recorded. Uh, and it will be put up on the internet uh, probably within a couple weeks after this this date, uh, and you can find and get access to that at changingclimate.osu.edu. So again, without further ado, let me go on with our actual webinar for the day. Today we have Dr. Dan Herms. He is a professor of entomology at Ohio State University. Uh, he received his PhD from Michigan State University. Uh, here at Ohio State, in addition to his uh, being a professor, he also serves as associate chairperson. He has a pretty heavy administrative load, but uh, he is a, an expert in the area of climate change and species and how climate change might affect species in our region. So what I will do now is uh, switch this over to Dr. Herms and make him the presenter. So okay. Dr. Herms, I believe you have the floor. Great. Well, thank you very much, Brent. Um, really appreciate the invitation, and I want to thank everybody out there for uh, spending their lunch hour with me today. Um, hope you find it worthwhile. I'm going to talk about effects of, of climate change on species interactions that are occurring in, in natural and agricultural ecosystems, some which are documented already, some of which are predicted to occur based on uh, anticipated changes in temperature and atmospheric carbon dioxide. And um, let's see, Brent. Okay, here we go. Good. 
of course, the, we're experiencing on a global basis a, a marked warming in, in the Earth's climate. In fact, the 10 warmest years in the last millennium and probably in the last 2,000 years have all occurred since 1998. And uh, the trend is you know, clearly upward. Uh, 2010 is sh probably shaping up unless something happens in the next couple months to, to be the warmest year recorded. And uh, this surface temperature uh, record compiled by uh, NASA is, is quite robust. It's corroborated by two other uh, surface records. And although these get challenged by uh, denialists uh, and skeptics, they're backed up also by satellite records, weather balloons, proxy reconstructions, and as we'll see, uh, changes in Earth's physical and biological systems that are already occurring that are consistent with warming. So this pattern of warming is, is quite robust. And in fact, NOAA published uh, a study here just uh, in the last month or so where they reviewed and compiled evidence re regarding uh, changes in 10 leading indicators that I have listed here, all of which are changing in the direction of, of a warming Earth. So there's a powerful convergence of evidence on the fact, uh, to support the fact that the Earth is warming. And um, corresponding with this warming, we've seen a, a dramatic uptick in the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which has increased exponentially, a sharp exponential increase since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and which is linked very compellingly to combustion of, of fossil fuels. And I'm not going to go into the evidence that links CO2 as a greenhouse gas to the warming that we've seen, um, other than to say that there is, again, a compelling uh, and powerful convergent convergence of evidence from a number of independent directions that support the fact that increase in greenhouse gases is the cause, the major cause behind the warming. What I do want to talk about then is what effect is this warming having on species and species interactions in natural and agricultural systems and also what effect is atmospheric CO2 having because that's also having and going to have dramatic effects. So talk about the effect that warming is having on the distribution of species, especially plants and, and cold-blooded organisms, um, but not exclusively. <clears throat> effects of distributions on all ecosystems. Talk about the effects that global warming is having on phenology, which is a study of, of reoccurring biological events, and how important phenology is to the functioning of ecosystems. Um, Phenological change has provided uh, a lot of evidence that the Earth is warming. And it's also uh, affecting how species interact with each other. So this change in distributions of species, change in their life cycles and timing, resulting in decoupling of species interactions, which can, which can disrupt ecosystem functioning effects of population dynamics, which is changing systems and ecosystems. And I'll talk about the effects of CO2 on plant quality and how that effect cascades down to the herbivores, including humans, uh, and then further into, uh, in, into ecosystem functioning. So those are the objectives, the effects of warming, the effects of CO2 on species interactions. And the signs of warming that I talked about from the physical record, uh, the, the instrument record, are apparent in natural systems throughout the planet. And so they're, they're well documented in, in terms of things like, you know, when is ice breaking up in the spring, long-term records on that. Um, let's see if I can get my laser pointer. Effects on the, the distribution of species that are migrating northward. I'll talk more about that. Fish that are migrating northward and fisheries that are changing their distributions, including uh, from one political uh, entity to another as, as fisheries move across uh, uh, political boundaries. 
changes in plant and animal life cycles as well as their distributions and uh, a paper here that summarizes through a meta-analysis a large number of, of studies all pointing to the same thing. The earth is warming and it's having effects that are already apparent on natural systems. And let's see, my computer seems to have locked up here. Here we go. Uh, other physical signs, glaciers are melting worldwide at the poles and alpine glaciers. Glacier National Park has lost most of its named glaciers since the inception of the park. Hydrology cycles are changing. All of these can have cascading effects on natural systems. The ocean is warming, which has had documented effects on coral reefs. Uh, the bleaching of coral in uh, uh, worldwide in tropical regions as uh, the coral expel their uh, symbionts when the water becomes too, too warm. And the question is, can coral migrate fast enough to keep track, to keep pace with the warming that's occurring? And the warming in the oceans is having other effects too. Sea level has risen, and most of that in the last century has been due to thermal expansion from the uh, the effect of, of heating. But now there is a signature that has become apparent in terms of melting of ice on Antarctica and, and in Greenland that is contributing to sea level rise as well. And the rate of sea level rise is, is starting to increase. And this is already having documented effects on terrestrial ecosystems. For example, these forest, uh, these coastal forests along the Gulf Coast of Florida have been experiencing a, a decline, a death of trees, uh, junipers and palms that are dying from salt uh, encroachment and converting to uh, grasslands, uh, salt marshes. So we're already starting to see an effect of sea level rise on terrestrial as well as the effects of warming on marine systems. This is a study that looked at the distribution of butterfly species in Europe and found that most have shifted their distributions northward, which is a general trend that's been documented in many insect and plant species as they're migrating north as, as the climate warms. This was a study published 10 years ago that had al already documented this uh, signature of, of global warming on species distributions. And so as the species migrate north in response to temperature, some can migrate at different rates than others. Insects can generally migrate faster for example, than trees or other plants, and that can disrupt ecosystems. There's also be effects of warming on agricultural production, and I thought this was an interesting study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which looked at uh, modeling of uh, production of, uh, or modeling of in changes in climate in grape growing regions that are used to produce high quality wine. And the alarming, or the pattern is, is alarming if you're a great producer in the United States. And this is looking at where uh, suitable grape growing regions will be by mid-century, given a predicted increase in temperature that's expected to occur if our CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, remain as they are. And the the redder the uh, the redder colors on the map indicate areas where uh, more years are suitable now for growing grapes. And so there's you know a restrict very restricted range in California there in the Central Valley, Nap the Northern Central Valley that you might expect and in the Appalachian and so forth right now. But as you see, as we move to uh, 2050, if you're a grape grower in Ohio, you're gonna be quite uh, disturbed by this because suitable grape habitat in Ohio, for example, has, has disappeared in terms of producing wine as it has from California. So these are some of the things that 
some of the effects that can happen as the climate no longer becomes suitable for agricultural production. One of the most dramatic impacts of changes in species distribution is occurring in northern British Columbia, where the largest bark beetle outbreak ever recorded is underway and has killed millions of hectares of lodgepole pine trees. And this is an area where the bark beetle could never survive before. Mountain pine beetle is the species. Could never survive because it was too cold for overwintering. And in recent years, it's become warm enough that they can survive the winter, and it's resulted in this massive outbreak that's, that's killed countless trees uh, over, as I said, millions of hectares to the degree that it's turned these northern pine forests from a carbon sink into a carbon source, uh, which is now contributing to CO2 emissions because of the the reduced photosynthesis and the decomposition of the, of the dead trees. And so this has been a, a recent study that actually just published a few months ago has found evidence that there's an evolutionary explanation behind this unprecedented outbreak. And the lodgepole pine, which has a, a wide distribution through North America, has populations that are evolutionarily adapted to their different habitats. And part of this evolutionary adaptation is whether or not the mountain pine beetle exists in that area. And these trees in northern Canada have never experienced mountain pine beetle in evolutionary time. And this study has shown that these beetles, or the trees there, are more susceptible. They're naive to this insect. They don't have high resistance to the insect that the more southern, for example, the, the Rocky Mountain populations have. And the resistance is based on chemicals that are produced by the tree. Uh, these resin, for example, that you see a bark beetle embedded in provides a physical defense, but it also, ha the composition of the resin varies amongst species. And the resin can be more or less toxic to mountain pine beetles. And the, ev the evidence is that these naive trees, which have not had the selection pressure from mountain pine beetle, are, are more susceptible. And so there's some positive feedback that comes into play as well, because the, the beetles have a behavior in which they aggregate on a single tree. They release an aggregation pheromone, a chemical, into the air, which attracts all their friends to the same tree. And so Bark beetles typically attack uh, weakened trees. Trees that have an evolutionary history anyway with the tree are naturally resistant. When they become stressed, they become susceptible, they become attacked. But when the numbers get high enough, even healthy trees can be overwhelmed by this mass attack behavior. And so then you get positive feedback and the, and the outbreak can essentially persist until all the trees are, are killed. The same thing's happening in the Rocky Mountains. And this is a picture from the Breckenridge area. And it's, it's actually quite hard to, from the ground to capture the scale of the mortality of, of the pine trees. But this is an area where mountain pine beetle and lodgepole pine have always coexisted. And so the answer here in the Rocky Mountains is not evolutionary naive, uh, naive na lack of evolutionary history but rather uh, increased stress. And this map shows the distribution of, of mountain pine beetle and lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pine in the red, mountain pine beetle, the hatched areas. And mountain pine beetle is increasing its ex incursions into the north until it becomes limited by winter. Now in a very disturbing development, this insect has breached the Rocky Mountains for the first time. It's now starting to move down the east slope of the Rocky Mountains into this zone where lodgepole pine and jack pine hybridize. This is quite disturbing because jack pine is known to be quite susceptible. And so for the first time now, there's a bridge across Canada through the boreal forest where mountain pine beetle can spread through the jack pine forest into the lake states where it will encounter pines that are native to the to the Great Lakes region, including red pine and white pine, which are also susceptible. So the fact that this warming has allowed the beetle to move up north, outbreak here, cross the Rockies, 
uh, may have devastating impacts or effects ultimately on the pine forests in the Great Lake region. And this is all outlined in this really nice paper which modeled and actually predicted this occurrence before uh, it happened. Now in the Rocky Mountains, as I mentioned, it's not lack of evolutionary history that's resulting in this uh, outbreak and positive feedback, but rather or st uh, stress. And I guess I have a slide out of order. Let's see if I can find it here. I guess it's missing. I'll, I'll probably, I don't know if I delete it or if it'll show up, but the stress is related to drought and heat. And the drought, the chronic drought that's occurring in the southwest has resulted in bark beetle outbreaks on, of, on lodgepole pine and also in other pine species throughout uh, the region. And this extended drought and the increased temperature, which has allowed more overwintering success at high latitudes, is also consistent with models of uh, climate change that um, or consistent with predictions of models of climate change for that region. So here there's precipitation effect and a warming effect, colonizing these or predisposing the trees to attack. Then positive feedback from the insect behavior resulting in large scale uh, effects. Fire suppression and overstocking land use has also contributed to this, this pattern. Another area where where bark beetles are having an impact quite some distance away that could be felt in Ohio and the Great Lakes region is with the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is one of the few true migratory species. And so the monarch butterflies that we see inhabiting our gardens and old fields and so forth in, the, in the Ohio and Midwest Canada, all over winter at a very small area in the mountains of Mexico and they migrate down they're doing it right now to this to these mount a few mountaintop peaks where they spend the the winter resting on these fir trees and they don't feed they just uh, hang out it's cool there which allows them to conserve their energy stores insects are cold blooded and they they burn through their energy reserves as a function of temperature it's cool, it's moist, and, and it's a favorable overwintering habitat. But it's getting warmer, and these fir trees now are subject to bark beetle outbreaks that are killing the trees. And so they're trying to do silviculture, thinning these trees out to try to uh, try to manage the bark beetle outbreak. It's not clear what will happen to the monarch butterflies if they lose these trees. They may find other sites to rest on. You know, the, the West Coast monarchs migrate uh, to the coast where they hang out on eucalyptus trees, and eucalyptus trees are not native to that area. So, you know, that's not an evolutionary choice. But um, what will happen when these fir trees die, if they do, uh, remains to be seen as of quite concern. Perhaps of more concern is the increased temperatures that are, are occurring in that habitat because that will cause, uh, if they get too warm, monarchs to ex expend their reserves uh, and they won't have the energy necessary to begin the migration back north. And so a continental scale population, including the Ohio populations, all concentrated in one little area makes the, the species highly vulnerable to changes in their environment. And climate change is a, certainly is a serious threat to the to the monarch population. Uh, plants are also changing their distributions, migrating northward. It's a general pattern. I show one example here. So it's such a common species in Ohio. This is for sugar maple, and uh, the yellow area shows the distri distribution of sugar maple yellow and green and the blue shows the predicted range of sugar maple as it migrates north as the climate warms and right now the limit the distribution is up to the upper great lakes through ohio but as it temperature warms over the next hundred years sugar maple is predicted to move 
you know, well up uh, into Canada, and in fact, out of all but the most uh, northern reaches of, of New England, Maine. So trees are migrating north. Uh, Lewis Iverson at, with the U.S. Forest Service in, in Delaware has done some really nice work to model the future distributions of forest and the community composition because not all the trees migrate at the same rate. And so the, the community composition, the forest composition that we have now in Ohio, in large part is a function of the rate at which species have migrated north following the recession of the glaciers. Our future forests are going to be a function of how fast species migrate north in response to climate change. But what's almost certain, and which in fact is already starting to, to be evident, is that the forests are going to change and they're going to be uh, resemble more uh, southern forests. And that'll bring with it some problems too. Southern pine beetle, which is a major problem of southern pines, has now started to uh, incursion this has started to uh, move into to southeast Ohio, into the pines in southeast Ohio, which we haven't seen uh, before. It's been too cold for them to survive the winter. And so northward migration of the key pest of pine trees also will alter forest structure. I want to shift from species distributions to talk a little bit about phenology. And phenology is the study of reoccurring biological events and their relationship to climate. So things like the flowering time of plants, breeding, migration times, and so forth. And of course, these type of biological events, phenological events, are intimately associated to, to climate and will be and have been impacted already by changes in climate. Phenology has been termed the world's oldest science. Humans have been obsessed with phenology for, for eons the foundational science of agriculture, planting seasons, birthing seasons, breeding seasons, and so forth, and it's uh, thus could be considered the foundational science of human civilization even today, even if, as we don't think about it much. But ancient humans have been consumed. Think about St Stonehenge, or in Ohio, think about Serpent Mound in southeast Ohio near Hillsboro. The coils uh, if you bisect the coils of, of the mound, they orient with key celestial events. The head is pointed directly at the summer solstice, and uh, ancient humans have always been uh, concerned with tracking the seasons because their existence depended on it. Phenology is uh, ex extremely important, and there's very powerful evidence that phenological events have already been altered by climate change. And, and one interesting study comes from uh, the records that Thoreau kept at Walden Pond. And he monitored very closely blooming periods and uh, of, the, of the species on uh, in the vicinity. And people have gone back in this paper published a couple years ago and looked at when they're blooming now and they're seeing that the growing season has has is coming earlier. Things are blooming about a week earlier now there at Walden Pond than they did in Thoreau's time, on average. Sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the the, the climate in a particular or the weather in a particular year. Similar pattern documented in Wisconsin at Sand County and Aldo Leopold, the consummate naturalist, also monitored the phenology of a number of organisms, plants, birds, and so forth. And his granddaughter, a uh, professor at Cornell, has gone back and taken a look at the same phenological events in the paper she published 10 years ago in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and also documented this change since, um, what, the 1930s, I guess, with a slope of about a tenth of a day per year change in the occurrence of phenological events. Here's some data from new phytologists from satellite imagery, just photographs from the sky showing that the Earth is getting greener earlier in the year and staying greener later in the year. Growing seasons are getting longer on both ends. Some data from uh, Eurasia and from North America showing an increase in the length of the growing season. 
phenological changes. Well, what's happening in, in Ohio? If you model changes that are expected to occur based on uh, various um, uh, based on various scenarios of, of emissions, what we see is by the end of the century, Ohio in the summer is going to resemble more present-day Arkansas and in the winter more present-day North Carolina. And so that you know can provide a pretty reasonable estimate about what the tree species composition and other species composition is going to be like 100 years from now in Ohio and what crops we may want to grow and so forth. Um, here's a, a study that was conducted throughout much of North America, including right here in Worcester at OERDC, where they've had lo a long-term phenological monitoring system where they planted these clonal lilac species uh, throughout uh, all these locations throughout North America. And the data are collected every year, submitted to the National Phenology Network. And the Worcester campus, these are growing in Secret Arboretum, and they're planted right next to the weather station. If you've ever noticed the lilacs there, you may have thought they were landscaping, but actually they're part of a, a long-term study that wasn't designed to document climate change, but it certainly has and shown that, uh, again, the onset of, of spring earlier with the local connection. And so thinking about the local connection, uh, this um, change in phenology is not only affecting plants and causing them to bloom earlier, but it's, it's causing insects to emerge earlier. And this was an interesting case, black vine weevil, which is one of the major nursery pests in Ohio, especially up along the, in the nursery growing region in Lake Erie. And uh, this is an area where I have extension uh, responsibilities. And I guess it was, was about 10 years ago, the growers were complaining that they were no longer getting control of, of this insect, which they had had under control for some time uh, since my predecessor had begun studying it in, in the early 70s. And it's a hard insect to monitor. The adults feed at night. The larvae do the damage by feeding on the roots, and so they're, they're subterranean. That makes those difficult to detect. When the adults come out, they feed at night and they hide during the day. That makes them difficult to detect. One of my graduate students, Gina Penny, um, at the time pictured here, did uh, her, her thesis research to study uh, the life cycle. The initial hypothesis was that the insect had become resistant to insecticide that they used to, to treat for it, which seems quite possible because it's a parthenogenic insect. It's a clonal insect. It doesn't fly, so you get these. Uh, it has a, a, a life cycle that would be prone to the evolution of insecticide resistance. But we looked at that right off the bat. We ruled that out. We were able to rule that out. Gina started looking at the life cycle and found out that they were emerging two to three weeks earlier than in 1970. Uh, and that's directly related to changes. If you look at the pattern or temperature records over that period, it's directly related to that. And so now we're telling the growers to use degree day models instead of calendar date. And their control is back on track to, to time their, their control methods. Another Ohio connection is this, uh, I think, very interesting document, the sixth annual report of the Ohio Agricultural Experiment Station, which is now OERDC. And so um, uh, these, this report documents the blooming times of trees and, and wildflowers in the Columbus area. And the author of this report is escaping me now, but a lazy bee. There's a building named after him on main campus. And if you look at the blooming dates of the trees and wildflowers that he documented in the 1880s, basically at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and before impacts of warming, what you see is that they, they are blooming, and you compare those to current, current time. Uh, they're blooming earlier in Worcester, which is about 100 miles north now, than they were in Columbus then. And so 
Worcester's typically a couple weeks behind Columbus in the spring if you're driving back and forth from Worcester to Columbus, as I do frequently. You know, you can see pretty dramatic differences in the phonology, and Columbus gives a good forecast of what's going to happen to Worcester in the, a week or, or two weeks, depending on the, the weather. But things are blooming earlier in Worcester now than they were in Columbus then. So that indicates about another three-week change in the growing season. It'd be interesting for a graduate student to to take these data and look at the same species in the Columbus area and do a, a direct uh, a direct comparison. This was the slide that I was going to show in conjunct, conjunction with the bark beetle outbreak in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains in Rocky Mountain National Park in the Breckenridge area, where you know over 90% of the lodgepole pine trees have been killed in recent years, and I talked about the the drought that's occurring as documented in this paper. Uh, the heat and the drought is contributing to an increase in fire frequency and intensity, which has been documented in this paper. It's all part of the same story that contributes to the bark beetle outbreaks. Now, an interesting thing to think about when it comes to phenology is the fact that, you know, plants and insects are both temperature dependent. And so their development um, can be predicted using degree days as a weather station at Worcester. You can, you can use daily temperature readings to calculate heat units or growing degree days, which can be used to predict, to model insect development, and predict their phenology, use that to time pest management. This weather station, fortunately, was not damaged by the recent tornado we had in Worcester, which passed just about 100 yards to the south, maybe even less. The weather station just was missed by the, the tornado. Uh, degree days are, are heating units are actually quite simple to calculate. Um, it's simply take the average temperature for the day and subtract a base temperature. And the base temperature is, is a temperature that you would want to approximate the, the lower developmental threshold. Cold-blooded animals like insects or cold-blooded organisms like plants have a temperature that when it drops below uh, that temperature, they will no longer develop. They'll just sit in suspended animation. You've probably all seen this in your garden on a cool day in the spring. They don't grow, and when it warms up, all of a sudden the flowers open. Insects do the same thing, and you can model this very simply, actually, with the average temperature. In this case, hypothetical day, a high of 70 degrees, a low of 40 degrees. Uh, the average would be 55. We use 50 degrees commonly as a base temperature because 50 degrees Fahrenheit is, is approximates pretty well the lower uh, developmental threshold for most for many plants and insects. So using this cal calculation, you would determine that five degree days had accumulated in the, over the course of that hypothetical day. And we pick a starting date like January 1, and we just add these, we just keep track of this day by day and keep adding them up. And then we sum those up, and we can use that to predict when insect uh, will emerge. And there's a few methods that are a little bit more precise and complex than this equation, but they're very actually very simple derivatives of this equation. But it's cumbersome to keep track of degree days, so we've developed uh, models for insect emergence and a website that you can go to. Here's the URL for that website. You can enter a zip code for any location in Ohio and can enter a date. The default would be today's date. You can enter other dates. And it will tell you how many degree days have accumulated in, in real time at that location. And this was, let's see, the date was June the 7th of 2010. In Worcester, uh, 825 degree days had accumulated using the formula and adding them up day by day since January 1st. The website tells you what insects are active, uh, takes them in order, it's a biological calendar, and what plants are blooming, because blooming of plants can be used as an indicator for uh, emergence of pests as well. And we're essentially saying that we can predict anywhere in Ohio at any time what's going to be blooming and what insects are going to be active. And it's it's been widely adopted by growers. It's been well tested even by my niece who can look out the window and see if the crab apple's blooming uh, when it's supposed to. You can also reconstruct phenological history and go to the same website, enter last year's date, in this case uh, June 7th, same date for Worcester, 
672 degree days had accumulated. What that compared to what was 855 for 2010, that's about two weeks worth of warm days difference in the phenology between the two years. And so uh, 2010 was much warmer spring than 2009, and the insects and plants emerge uh, correspondingly earlier. Now, we've used these degree day models in collaboration with Robin Taylor here in our department, uh, John Cardina in Horton Crop Science, and Richard Moore now in the School of Environment and Natural Resources to model the phenology of crop pests and how that will be affected by climate change. And so we've used degree day models as well as models of uh, climate warming for Ohio and looked at how key agricultural pests of uh, corn and soybean are going to be affected over the next 100 years. And to make a, a long story short, what we're seeing is that the distributions of key pests are going to move north and key, some pests are going to have, like corn borer, more generations per year in Ohio than they currently have. And in all cases, we're going to see increased yield reductions due to insect feeding of these key crop pests um, relative to what we're seeing now. In the absence of insecticides, we're going to see reduced yields uh, due to pests. So this is an example of using degree day modeling to predict what may happen in Ohio in agricultural phenology. Not just insects. Warm-blooded animals also are being affected by this. Um, birds are responding to it, and many species of birds are laying their eggs earlier, um, some birds by, by quite a bit. Um, and so there's, you know, all kinds of organisms that we've already have documented phenological changes. And I'm not going to go through this, but just to point out that in this review paper, this nice review paper shows how phenology really is at the center of all kinds of ecological interactions in ecosystems, from flowering to pollination to leaf emergence, to um, ultimately to community structure and how, and how they interact with it. So these effects on phenology are going to be have pervasive, in many cases, unpredictable effects on community structure and evolution. Some example is how phenology may uncouple interactions between plants and herbivores, plants and pollinators, and so forth. And if if one species reacts to temperature in one way and another species in another way, then as climate changes, the way they interact now will be altered. And for example, this wasp has to lay its egg on this shoot just at the right time if it, this gall will form and this offspring will survive. They're both responding to temperature. But if their temperature response curve is different, in fact, most species have different response curves, this phenological synchrony will be disrupted and this wasp will not be able to survive. It will have to adapt or, or shift. So a well-documented pattern is that insects have a phenological window in which their host plant is suitable when they can feed successfully on their window for, uh, on, on their, during a period of time on their foliage. For example, uh, my graduate student, Rodrigo Torbajian, studied this phenological window with sawflies and pines and manipulated. The sawfly feeds in a very narrow window of period in early spring on the old needles. It cannot survive on the new needles. Uh, but the question is, why does it only feed on old needles in the spring? Because old needles are present all year round. And so what he did was manipulate egg hatch and then looked at performance on needles of different ages. And what he found is that as the shoot, the pine shoot gets older, the growth of the insect decreases dramatically to the point where they can't survive. Larval growth goes to zero. And so there's a very narrow window of time when the needles are suitable. And that was related to amino acid concentrations, which are being um, mobilized and transported to the new needles. And during that period, the plant is susceptible. During the rest of the year, it's resistant. Now, if an insect and a plant have a different 
response to temperature like they do in this example and you have a warm year uh, in this example the tree will win in a cool or excuse me in this year the insect will win in a colder year the tree will win if climate changes and they have different response curves it will decouple the synchrony and the insect will lose and almost all simulations show the insect losing as you dis, as you decouple phenological uh, relationships. In this case, uh, it's a, a parasite and an herbivore, a white fly and its parasitic wasp that lays an egg. And the number of eggs they lay, it's hard to read on this axis, is very temperature dependent. In cool temperatures, the white fly wins. At warmer temperatures, the parasite wins. But temperature has a huge effect on the population dynamics as it's regulated by this parasite, the, the populations of the white fly. Plant pollinator interactions are tightly coupled because the pollinator has to be there at the right time to pollinate the plant. And this is a case where if the insect loses, the plant will lose too. It will lose the pollination services if the phenology of the flower becomes decoupled from the phenology of the insect. Birds, if, as birds, if birds become decoupled from their food supply, the phenology of their migration, then their breeding will be disrupted. And in fact, that's been uh, documented for Arctic geese as their migration has been altered and as the, as the phenology of the plants they feed on has become altered, it has resulted in uh, reduced quality and reduced uh, offspring performance. Now finally, I want to move away from temperature and just talk about direct effects of CO2 because CO2 has huge effects on plant physiology, on photosynthesis and respiration. And as CO2 increases, it also has big effects on plant chemistry. And typically, the defensive concentrations of defensive compounds increase as CO2 increases and photosynthesis increases. That these defensive compounds, phenolic compounds, anthocyanins, tannins, and so forth, give the the, the leaves, these young leaves, uh, the redder color, have higher concentrations. This affects the insects that feed on them. The effects can be in non-predictable ways. This is a graduate student working in my lab, Vanessa Mullenberg, a, a presidential fellow at Ohio State. She's been studying the effects of CO2 on birch trees and bronze birch borne. She's been working at this uh, uh, experimental site run by Michigan Tech and the Department of Energy and the U.S. Forest Service in northern Wisconsin, a face free uh, air CO2 exposure experiment. They pump CO2 from these tanks into these rings to simulate what the CO2 concentration will be in our atmosphere by 2050 if we operate as we have. And this shows uh, kind of some of the infrastructure. And they have these replicated rings. They're 75 meters in diameter. And she's been looking at birch interactions with bronze birch borer. And birch has a, a distribution through the boreal forest, extends down into the, to the Great Lakes region and northward up into Alaska. And this insect is a, a wood borer, feeds on birch. And when birch gets stressed by outbreaks, these insects can overcome the tree's defenses and kill it by the larvae destroying the vascular tissue. And what she found is that when you increase the CO2 concentration, uh, and she's also looking at ozone, you increase ozone, the trees become stressed and they become colonized by uh, bronze birch borer at a higher rate. If you increase CO2, the red line, they also become colonized at a much higher rate. The mechanisms are different. Ozone weakens the tree. CO2 seems to make the tree more nutritious for this insect. Um, bronze birch borer during heat spells kills trees at the southern range. And so as CO2 increases, bronze birch borer could, be, could contribute to pushing the distribution of birch northward. Uh, similar pattern has been seen at the soybean face site at the University of Illinois where they're fumigating soybean with elevated CO2 and finding increased, dramatically increased defoliation by Japanese beetle and the leaves have higher sugar concentration, um, which is favoring the uh, beetles feeding on this. Now, this is not universal. In many cases, the insects are actually uh, 
negatively impacted because of the increased defensive compounds. This is a study we did looking at forest tent caterpillar and gypsy moth feeding on aspen. In all cases, again at Rhinelander, they were negatively infect, uh, impacted by elevated CO2 as their food became better defended and less nutritious, feeding on the leaves rather than on the trunks of the trees like the borer. Uh, insects aren't the only herbivores, not just insect nutrition. This was an interesting study published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution showing that as CO2 increases, the carbon to nutrient ratio of vegetation increases and the concentration of uh, essential elements decrease. And they looked at this from the con uh, context of human nutrition. And are our crop plants going to be nutritionally inferior under a high CO2 world? The green bars are all plants, yellow uh, bars are grains. And so decreased concentrations of essential uh, minerals in a high CO2 world. So uh, with that, I conclude that uh, with the inescapable conclusion that as the world changes, as it gets warmer and CO2 concentrations climb, it's already having pervasive effects. And these are just going to become magnified. And we'll see these in predictable and unpredictable ways permeating natural systems. So with that, uh, I'll acknowledge some of my colleagues and uh, turn it back over to, to Brent for questions. Thank you. Great. Hey, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, we really appreciate that. I'm sure uh, were everyone able to, they would they would go ahead and clap and, and be very thankful for your presentations. We all appreciate um, We did. We have a few minutes here for questions, and I did get a number of questions from a number of people, even though uh, many of you didn't see the questions uh, to everyone. I got a number of them privately, so I'll just go through. I've grouped, been able to group a few of them together, and so I'll just put them out there. A couple people asked. I'll start out with this, um, and, and actually two related questions. So one is, is how might climate change play a role in the impact of invasive species? So, and one person in particular, I think Jill put that with respect to the emerald ash borer. One person thought about that more generally. Uh, so we'll start out with that, Dan. Yeah. Well, invasive species are is an interesting question and a number of studies have been published to look at that i it's it's hard to make generalized sense uh, you know uh, will invasive species be favored or will they not be favored right? what you need to look at is you know what kind of climates are the are they adapted to and how how will global warming change the climates if they change them in ways that favor that particular species, then I think invasion will be facilitated. Uh, in the specific case of emerald ash borer, and I've been asked that uh, you know, a few times, and for those that don't know, emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle that's wiping out our native ash trees. And at this point, it really is a, an issue of, of global trade that you know results in the introduction of those species. But a recent study suggests that emerald ash borer may not be able to tolerate winters, uh, the, the cold in extreme extreme winters, where, whereas ash can. Uh, black ash in particular can extend far north into Canada. And studies show that emerald ash borer cannot tolerate uh, those kind of extreme cold winters. So ash may have a, a northern refuge. Of course, as the climate warms, that will facilitate the you know more northward spread of, of emerald ash borer as those uh, uh, the range of lethal temperature um, uh, moves farther north. Right now, the most northern infestations of emerald ash borer in southern Can Sault Ste. Marie, Canada, and, and the Twin Cities. It looks like most winters it may not be able to survive northern Minnesota. And as you move farther north, it, it may not survive. So that's a tough question to answer. Great. Uh, thanks. Well, I, as, as many of you can see, one of the questions posed by uh, Matt is related to pollinators. You mentioned that in at least one slide uh, related to uh, Matt's asking about bees. Actually, several other people asked about that privately. So so what is what do you think will happen with, with bees and, and pollinators? And what real what's the real threat to agriculture from that? Right. Well, honeybees, um, honey, honeybees are, are, are 
you know, pretty adaptable. And they run into, uh, I'm not a honeybee expert, they run into trouble, you know, with extreme cold and trying to keep their hives warm, uh, you know, using metabolic heat in their, their hives. Um, they generate, you know, they generate their own heat to warm their hives and they expend stores uh, doing that. And, um, you know, honeybees are, are, you know, extremely widely distributed globally. And, you know, I, I haven't read any papers that specifically link uh, threats to honeybees you know, to global warming. And I think in the United States, it's, it's probably going to relax some stress on the populations in northern limits. I haven't seen anything that links colony collapse disorder to to climate change. As it gets extremely hot, too, they have to air condition their hives. Access to water becomes important and so forth. Native pollinators may experience more of a, a problem if, if they become uh, decoupled from their uh, nectar sources that, that they depend on. And this may be especially true in alpine populations where they, you know, where they tend to migrate north, uh, or not north, up, up uh, in altitude as it gets warmer and warmer. And at some point, you can't go any higher. And, you know, there are studies now that are looking, that have documented uh, threats to, to alpine pollinators. <clears throat> interesting, interesting. Um, just a couple notes. We will uh, take, uh, or I will ask a couple more questions here. Uh, we're going to go to one o'clock, so everyone knows we will be ending at one o'clock. So we've got about three minutes left. I just did want to remind everyone we will be sending out a uh, survey related to this uh, webinar, and would certainly welcome your input, advice, and thoughts on the webinar and what we can do to improve them in the future. Uh, comments will be very, very, very helpful to us. Um, so going on with another question, uh, Dan, actually a couple people asked it. Um, Ken Scott asked about the, the sugar maple slide you had, and he didn't, it didn't show a time frame, so I was wondering about the, the time frame for that. And then uh, related to that, several people asked, well, you know, what can we, what can we plant? You know, some of these slides, the slide you showed with Ohio moving south indicates that, you know, trees we plant today will still be alive possibly in 2095, certainly in 2035. What should we be planting? How should we be changing, um, you know, our planting decisions now. Right, right. Um, good questions. Well, the the rate of the time frame on the spread of sugar maple, that's a, that's a good question, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I would have to, I suspect there's an estimate in the literature, and the rates of spread of these trees are, you know, species dependent. A lot depends on how their seeds are dispersed, uh, how fast, uh, they grow to reach maturity and so forth. And um, sugar maple seeds are dispersed relatively short distance in the wind as those little helicopters. And they they take they they don't. It takes them a lot a while to get uh, to be reproductively mature. So uh, I would think that the rate of migration of sugar maple will be slow compared to other species. And there's evidence that it's still migrating northward hasn't reached its equilibrium uh, following the glaciers. Other tree species will migrate much faster. And the way they estimate those is looking at uh, pollen, uh, the pollen record in, in sediment cores and look at how fast they've migrated northward after the recession of, of the glaciers. So um, what was the second half of that question, Brent? Uh, oh, what to plant. So, you know, that's a good question too, and it's relevant to, to gardeners as well, you know, as well as foresters. I was at a conference going back to EAB, Invasive Insects and Climate Change. I was at a, a forestry management conference in um, Bemidji, Minnesota, and they were dealing with that question with these uh, black ash, expansive black ash forests in, in northern Minnesota. And if emerald ash borer can survive and do well there, those those swamp forests will be um, eliminated or severely impacted. And so uh, Lewis Iverson with the Forest Service, for example, is looking at which species 
interact or grow in conjunction with black ash in more southern climates, thinking that those are going to be the ones that will inhabit that same habitat farther north. And so silver maple and, and some of the sycamore and some of these more southern uh, species. As far as what to plant in Ohio, uh, you know, northern Ohio is basically converted from a zone five to a zone six, if you're familiar with the USDA hardiness zones. And I know in the Arboretum, they've, they've started experimenting around planting southern magnolias, and they seem to be hanging on. I probably that's going to be at their northern limits of their distribution. I'd I'd be looking at species that have a a fairly you know large distribution, and there's many species where, where Ohio is kind of in the middle. If you look at red maple, river birch extends quite a bit south, and so those species are going to continue to persist in Ohio for a long time. So species that are more near their uh, southern limits of their distribution that are going to be pushed out of Ohio. And if you're thinking long term, you, you may not want to plant those species. Great. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Dan. I'm I'm going to have to call the uh, this webinar to a close. We're 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 sort of just a minute past the one o'clock time. But on the questions that were asked that we didn't get to, and there are several here, uh, several people sent to me privately as well as, as showed up to everyone. Um, we're going to get answers to those and have those on the website. So go to that changingclimate.osu.edu. Uh, and we'll have the answers uh, with this webinar. So when you go onto that webinar, you'll see um, sort of a transcript for it, and you'll also see some question and answer there. And uh, so the other questions will be answered, and we'll get, we will get to that. Um, thanks to everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Again, we're going to send out a survey, and we really would appreciate your response to it and, and comments on it. So again, uh, Dr. Herms, thanks so much for participating, and everyone else, thank you for participating. We'll look forward to... Uh, seeing everyone or talking with everyone again on November 2nd. Thanks. Yes, thank you, everybody, for your attention.